Hello, Jordan here from Artisan Electrics. Welcome back to the channel. And if you're new here, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Today I've got a video all about filling out the EICR forms using online software. I recently made a video about an EICR I did where there was a lot of dramatic problems that I found along the way. I'll put a link up here so you can have a look at that video. But um, if you watch that video, many people were asking me, how do you code the various faults that you found and how do you fill out the EICR form? So that's what I'm gonna show you today. I've got an amazing piece of software by a company called Vespula who make this fantastic certification software. So I'm gonna show you how that works. And I'm gonna go through clip by clip all the little problems that I found in that previous video and show you using the EICR Code Breakers book by Napit how you can code the faults and then using the Vespula software how we can actually fill out the EICR form and create a really good comprehensive EICR. So I hope you enjoy this video. If you do, hit a thumbs up. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel because we post videos here every week about the life of an electrician and electrical subjects. So I hope you enjoy. Thanks for watching and enjoy the video. So the Vespula software is available on computer, on tablet and on phone. So all the various platforms that you might want to use, you can get it on. And they are developing an app which will be coming out very soon as well. But it's super easy to use, so I'm going to give you a little tour of the software and show you how it works. Now the software that I use for this is called Vespula. And I want to send a massive thanks out to Vespula because they've sponsored this video. So you're going to get to see some awesome certification software the certification software that I use on a day-to-day -day basis and I'm going to show you how it works. And the great thing about it is it's really, really quick to use. So it saves me a huge amount of time because there are loads of time-saving features in there that avoid you wasting time filling out the same details over and over again. So I'm going to show you all about that as we go through the video. If you like this video, hit a thumbs up and let's get into it. So first of all, the consumer unit here. So this is the consumer unit that we had. And what I want to do is go into the software and just fill out the details of the consumer unit. So this is it. This is Vespula and it's a, a completely cloud based software, but it stores all the data on your local device. So it means that if your internet gets cut off for some reason, you don't lose all your data, which is brilliant. And it constantly communicates with the cloud and updates the data in the cloud as well. So there's always a copy of the data stored in the cloud, but there's a copy of the data stored on your local device as well. And you can use Vespula on your computer or on your tablet or on your smartphone. So it, it works on every different platform basically, which is really handy. So I could be on site right now with my phone putting this data in and it'd be the exact same platform that we'd be using. So what I'm going to do first is create a new job and I'm just going to create a name for the job which I'm going to call YouTube EICR and then I'm going to click electrical installation condition report create. Now obviously you saw there you've got a massive selection of different forms that you can use so um, you can choose to, and you can do all the different types of certificates here uh, I already had one called YouTube EICR because I did a practice run earlier so I'm just going to call it YouTube EICR final but you can see here the list so you've got minor work certificates electrical installation certificates emergency lighting fire alarm solar photovoltaic so pretty much every kind of certificate that you might need to produce as an electrician, you can do it through this software, which is really, really handy. So I'm just going to create that certificate now. And there you go. I've got my job has come up. You've got a space for contract reference if you've got one. What I want to choose now is the purpose of the inspection. So I'm going to click on to local authority requirements because it was actually for getting a HMO license that I was doing this EICR. But as you can see there again, each time you've got drop down boxes with all the usual reasons why you would have an inspection. So house purchase, insurance, tenancy agreement, 
or just to ascertain the current condition. But if you want to, with any of these, you can also click other and then you can just type in whatever you would like and add that as a reason. So as I said, I'll choose local authority requirements. Then extent of the installation inspection, you've got three options, visual only, visual and partial verification or visual and full verification, which is what I did. So I'm gonna pop that in there. Compliance to BS code of practice. So we're measuring it to a BS 7671 2018, the 18th edition. And the date of the work, I'll just put today's date. To re be reviewed and issued, so imagine you are the electrician on site, you put this as the date, but then if you've got a QS who's in the office checking the certificates, that's a qualified supervisor who signs off on and approves the certificates or reports, then he could put a separate date in there for the date when he actually reviewed the EICR and issued it to the client. Next inspection due in, so usually for a rental property it'll be every five years or a non-rental domestic property every 10 years, but that's up to you as the engineer to decide. But because this is a fail, I'm gonna select six months and just give them six months to get the remedial works done before it needs checking again. Records available, there weren't any, so I'll put no for that. And then it just says where no previous documentation is available, inspection, investigation of the electrical installation shall be undertaken prior to carrying out the periodic inspection and testing. So that's fine. Records held by, I'll just leave that blank. Then we've got here the contact details. So up at the top here, you'll see an address book. That address book can be used to put all your customers' details in and it will keep them and store them there. So if you ever come back and do another job for the same customer, in this drop down box here, which I'm not gonna click because it will show you all my customers' details, you'll actually find the uh, customer name and all you do is click that and it will automatically fill out their telephone number, email address, um, postal address and all that stuff so it's really handy and then you can do the same with the installation address put the installation address details in there and they'll be stored in the system in your address book. Description of installation so type of premises we have various options domestic commercial industrial school hospital or other so I'm going to select domestic estimated age of the installation I would estimate that it's about 30 years old there were alterations and they were done in 2017 so I'll put age three years for the alterations that's obviously when the consumer unit the previous consumer unit was installed um, then if there was a previous inspection which is part of your system you can select the previous inspection here but obviously I'd never inspected this property before and then you've got an ins previous inspection date and number if it's an inspection that was done by somebody else but you've got the EICR report and you can put the number in there then we click next and we go to the installation um, the client details so sometimes the client is different from the actual installation address for example this one the client name and address will be the landlady but the installation address is the address where we actually did the report again I'm not going to click on these because I don't want to give away any personal data of my customers but you get the point it's very straightforward and once they're in your address book you just click the name and address and it automatically fills out everything for you so inspector contact details so I have myself down and a couple of subcontractors who do work for me from time to time and all I need to do is click this and it will put my details down in there so that's me all my details in there as the inspector and um, so it puts my name my title phone number email address all that stuff down there postal address NIC EIC registration number etc now my test instrument details again I've registered my tested instrument here in the test instruments section so all I need to do now is select my test instrument that's already down there and it's got it here with the serial number and I can just select that for all the various tests that I've done and select NA for earth electrode resistance because I didn't do any earth electrode testing. They are gonna add a feature soon where you have the option of multifunction tester and you only need to select it once, but that's just a small thing. It doesn't take long to do that anyway. 
authorizer, that's me again. So I'll put that in. And it just, see, it auto just auto fills everything, which is fantastic. Authorizer registration details are already saved in my contacts list, so it just puts those in automatically. Uh, so now we come to limitations. So what we're going to do is leave this blank for the moment and we'll go and fill out all the limitations at the end there once we've seen the EICR video and then we can make sure we don't forget anything. But a little bit of information here is what's handy is you've got these little pop-up windows when you click on the information or hover over the information button and it gives you some advice about things like the limitations uh, or whatever it happens to be that um, it makes it easier to know what kind of things you should be filling into that box if you don't know that already. Next we go to the condition of the installation. So I'm going to fill out this at the end again because we want to go through and just have a, a thorough view of the whole installation before I fill this out. And again the overall assessment of the installation, I'm going to fill that out at the end. So we go to supply and earthing now. And when we click across to our YouTube video, you can see here, this is a TNS system, which means that the earth is provided separately by the supplier. And it's actually forms part of the sheath of this lead cable. So usually when it's got a clamp on the cable, then you know that it's a TNS system. So I'm going to click that. And again, if we hover next to it on the I button, it tells us that Terra means earth. N means neutral and S means separate, which means it has a separate earth provision provided by the public electricity supplier. It may take the form of a termination made to the metal work of the armor of the incoming supply cable, which is what we just said. So these are really handy, you know, it just it kind of helps you to learn if you're new to all this. Um, TNC as it explains that for you, TT it explains that for you as well. So it's a nice little feature. Number uh, of and type of live conductors, we've got a choice of AC or DC. Well, obviously it's an AC system. A number of phases, we've only got one phase. Two wires because we've got the phase and the neutral. Then once you select that, you see it automatically fills out 230 volts as the nominal voltage, which is standard for single phase systems in the UK. And 50 Hertz is standard frequency. Nominal voltage U is the voltage between lines, i.e. phase to phase, which is typically 400 volts, but as we don't have more than one phase here, that doesn't apply, so we can leave it blank. External earth fault loop impedance, so we need to fill out this. So let's go to the EICR video and see what our external fault loop impedance was. If we go to 39 minutes, I will show you what I found. 2.33 2.36 there you go which is way too high for a um, ZE for a TNS system so there is obviously a problem on the supplier's cable so we had 2.33 so we're going to put that in and that's too high so I did report it to the DNO and they came out and fixed it but this is the initial EICR, so we're just filling this out. Now, prospective fault current, which is measured with the main earth connected. Let's see what we got for that. So I'm going to skip forward a little bit to 40 minutes and 30 seconds. There we go. For ZDB. So and 103 got. amps prospective fault current. That was our ZDB. And I'll do a live to neutral as well. So we got 0 0.34 ohms, 729 amps or 0 0.72 Ka. So that is our perspective fault current. You can have perspective earth fault current as well, which is what I measured earlier, which was lower, but we always record the highest of the two readings. So in this case, usually and usually it's the case that the line to neutral perspective fault current is the highest so 729 amps if you um, change that into kilo amps that's 0 0.72 ka kilo amps number of supplies one 
Confirmation of phase sequence is not applicable because there was only one phase. Supply polarity was okay, so we put yes for that. Now the primary supply over current device. Uh, so let's go back to the EICR video and see what we had for that. Suppliers cut out a few size because it's one of those old ones that's not labelled. But I'm assuming it's a 60 amp as it's 16 mil tails. We'll have to put that as a limitation on the report. So because we can't identify it, because there's no labelling on and it is sealed and everything, I'm not, I'm not going to pull the main fuse in this situation. So what I did is just marked it as a limitation. So in primary overcurrent protective device, as you can see, we've got this pop-up window with all these various um, options here. But I'm just going to uh, put limitation. And um, we'll go to our limitations section and add that in. So again, um, we'll just leave that blank for the type. For the nominal rating, we'll put limitation as well. Short circuit capacity limitation as well. Um, so if we then flick back to our limitations sheet, and we'll just put suppliers main out fuse could not be identified um, I'll put actually put type and rating of rating of suppliers main cutout fuse could not be identified okay so we've added that in there uh, let's go back now to uh, the section where we were before is supply and earthing still over there. Right, so that's all those limitations in. Now details of the supply, there are no other sources of supply, so we leave this blank, but it could be, for example, that there's a generator, a, a backup generator with a um, changeover switch or something like that. You would add those kind of alternative sources of supply there. Means of earthing, so we have these three main options, supplies, facility, installation, earth, electrode, or supplies facility and in installation earth electrode. Well, in this case, it's supplies facility. There was no earth electrode. But if it was a TT system, for example, then usually it would be installation earth electrode. So we go to the next section now, particulars of the installation at the origin. And we've got to calculate maximum demand. So if we go to the consumer unit again, and we can just see the ratings of the various MCBs. Here we go. Um, so we've got a B32 for the cooker, B16 for the water heater circuit, but that was actually only a boiler that was on there, so it didn't take much. Two 16 amp radials for the sockets, smoke detectors and lights. Let me know in the comments how you would do maximum demand calculation, because this is something that many people struggle with, because there's not a lot of guidance out there. BS7671 just says that you should calculate maximum demand and that you should take diversity into account when doing so, but it doesn't really give you a guide of how to calculate that. Um, so for an electric cooker, what I would usually say is I would allow 20 amps for that because obviously uh, not all of the elements will be running at once and things like that. So 20 amps is probably about right for an electric cooker. For the boiler, I think I would probably only allow five amps for that because there's not much going on, just sort of a pump and uh, various little bits and pieces. Sockets, I think because of this size of this house, I'm going to allow the full capacity for both of these circuits, so 16 for each. For the smoke detectors, I won't even count that because it's very negligible how much they take. Uh, but for the lights, again, I'll allow the full capacity of the circuit because there are quite a lot of lights throughout the house. So w what that gives us is 20, 5, so that's 25, 16 and 16, so that's 32 in total for that, plus the 6, so that's 38. 38 plus 25 is 63. So that gives us 63 amps as our maximum demand. So I go back now to my software and I put 63 
as the maximum demand. Method of fault. Oh, I'm not going to put A for amps here because you can do it in KVA or amps. Method of fault protection. I'm going to choose ADS, automatic disconnection of supply, as it is a system that uses RCD protection for automatic disconnection. Main switch location, consumer unit. BSEN number for the main switch. Usually they are 60947-3. For a normal double pole switch disconnector sometimes in the older boards you have a 5419 but usually it's marked on the switch disconnector itself so for example this one you can just about see it there bsen 60947-3 so you should always look for the bs number on any circuit breakers or switches usually it should be visible um type is not applicable Number of poles is two because obviously it's switching the live and the neutral. Uh, voltage rating is let's see, uh, does it say on there? I think it says two thirty slash four hundred on there. So I'll just put two thirty. Oh, I can put two thirty slash four hundred actually. Um, current rating is a hundred amps. Again, it's marked on the main fuse. It doesn't have a fuse device rating, so we'll just leave that blank or in fact I'll put in a number of conductors is two because we have the phase in the neutral conductor supply conductors material is copper some installations do have aluminium but not usually in the domestic setting uh, supply conductors CSA so that's cross-sectional area in this case it was 16 millimeter squared there is no front-end residual current device that would be if there was an RCD basically just after the main uh, electric meter to protect the whole installation but there isn't in this case so we'll put NA 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 and then we come to our main product uh, protective conductors so earthing conductor is copper uh, as you can see there from the background it was six millimeter squared and I checked the continuity and it was okay and then the main productive protective bonding conductors again were copper they were also six millimeter squared and the continuity was okay on those now the gas was there i showed you the clamp was a little bit dodgy but um, it was the conductor was okay and the water i believe that it was present so we've got our main bonding to the water here Again, not the best of bonding connections, but there is one there. However, it is a PVC pipe, so it doesn't technically need bonding anyway now. Um, so not too worried about that one. So it did actually have a 10 mil bond going to it. Um, I'm just going to put NA because it's not actually needed in this case. So rather than putting yes, I'm just going to put NA because it is a plastic incomer and all the rest I'm going to put NA as well because they don't apply there's no structural steel or oil or lightning protection in the system so we click next and that takes us to observations so what we're going to do is first of all fill out the um, certificate uh, the board schedule because that will give us some automatic observations based on the readings and then we'll come back and we'll go through the EICR video and add in all the rest of the observations that we found. So I'm going to click boards now. And this button to create a new board. I'll enter the name of the board, which I'll just call DB1. And then I've got an option here if I want to set the default circuit insulation resistance reading. Uh, in this case, I don't want to do that because that will fill it in for the spares as well. And I don't really want to fill that out for the spares. Um, the main supply source for the board is a main supply, but you can do, for example, a board already in the system. So if this was a sub board and I was adding it on from another board, I could select the other board name and, and circuit number and it would add this in as a sub board. Or you can have it as a board that's not in the system if, there's, if it's what they call a ghost board where um, there's another board that it's fed from but you're not actually testing that board then you can put it in like that but here it's just a simple domestic installation so main supply is fine 
and then you can create the circuits for the board so you can choose whether it's a three phase board two phase board single phase board or create the circuits individually now this is because three phase board with circuits of the same type that would be a three phase board with all three phase circuits for example or a three phase board with all single phase circuits if you want to mix it up a bit and have a three phase board that's got some three phase circuits and some single phase circuits you would do this option and then you can choose one two three l1 l2 l3 you can choose exactly what's what's what in there um, so I am going to add the circuits later so I'll just save changes to that and it's created my board now so to create my circuits I click on my board and uh, first I need to add <coughs> excuse me I need to add my board details so I've got location of distribution board under stairs cupboard distribution board designation I can put lighting and power DB manufacturer not that it's really necessary but it's an option so why not fill it out BG good old British general I prefer my Haker boards as you know uh, DB type so you can select the type of DB and this in this case it's a single pole and neutral and it's not split load so we'll just select that number of phases um, one, 230 volts automatically filled out details of circuits or installed equipment vulnerable to damage when testing so I will put circuit 6 uh, smoke alarms because you're not supposed to insulation test those so I've just put that in default insulation resistance I'm just going to leave that blank for the moment Supply is from the main supply, so that's fine. So I'll click done on that. Uh, oh, then I need to do the board test results. So I go to the ZDB figure here, which was 2.4 ohms. Respective fault current, which we already had earlier, was 0.72 Ka. Confirm phase sequence is not applicable. Confirm supply polarity. That's basically that the phase are neutral the right way around. Um, that is correct and then it's already got my test instruments in here and I can put the tester name down as myself so that's fine now circuit details so this is where this software really comes into its own and saves you a lot of time because what you can do is make template circuits already so up here I go to circuit templates I've already created some templates for the various standard circuits that I usually come across so water heater sockets radial ring circuit heating circuit cooker circuit right uh, I'm gonna add a new circuit template just to show you how it works for lighting because that's a pretty standard one as well so I click here create new circuit template and I'll just put lighting and the circuit description I can put lighting in there as well and then I can afterwards add uh, upstairs lighting or downstairs lighting or whatever PVC twin and earth is pretty standard for me reference method is usually 100 circuit conductors is usually 1 mil for lighting and 1 mil for CPC max disconnection 0.4 seconds overcurrent protective device well, it's usually probably a 60898 MCB, but in this case it's an RCBO, so I'll select that. Type is type B. Rating, usually 6 amps. Short circuit capacity for domestic is usually 6, amp, six kiloamps as well. And then default insulation resistance test result, I'll put as greater than 500 mega ohms. Now I click done. See, this has added it now to my list of um, circuit templates. So up here I click back to job and then I can just add my circuits in. So circuit number one and then I choose circuit template. So let's go back to our um, circuit schedule here so we can see the consumer unit. There we go, right. Okay, so the first circuit here was the cooker circuit. It's a B32 amp with six mil cable. So what I'm gonna do is select my circuit template for a cooker circuit save changes and boom 
Look at that, it puts all the details in already for a standard cooker circuit. So all I need to do is check that that's correct, add the number of points, which in this case is one. Yes, it was six mil cable, yeah, everything is good on that. And it calculates my max ZS for me automatically, which is great. So then I'll add the next circuit, which was the water heater circuit. So I'll click water heater. That's just another template that I've made. In this case, it's calling it immersion heater, but I'm going to change that to boiler because that's a more accurate description. And then again, I'm going to just put the number of points, which was actually two on this circuit because there was a spur for the boiler downstairs and then a spur upstairs for the controls for the central heating. Um, everything else on there is okay, so I'm happy with that. Now add another circuit, the sockets. So if I put sockets radial, because it was a 16 amp, there I've got my standard radial socket circuit. And again, all I need to do is add in my number of um, points. So we had 19 points on this particular radial. So I'll put that in. Um, And then I uh, can't see the rest, but those should be already filled out and adequate. So let me do uh, this now. Circuit four. Again, it's a, a sockets radial circuit. So I can put that in. And it's just called it sockets because I've put that as a default. But, but for this one, for example, um, because there was only two sockets on it, I can be more descriptive in what I call it. So I can put sockets, um, fridge, freezers. Because it was actually just two additional sockets that they added in for that. And then I'll put two there as the number of points. And then that's all good. Then I add another circuit, which I will, I'll select my lighting template. Um, but actually it wasn't lighting, it was smoke alarms, this one. So what I'll do, because it's pretty much the same as a lighting circuit anyway, I'll just call it smoke alarms. And then number of points, there were eight um, smoke alarms there. One mil cable and everything else is filled out. So that's all good. And then lighting, again, I'll select a template for a lighting circuit. And I'll just call it lighting as in the template because that's pretty good because it describes you know the whole lighting for the whole house. Um, and it was 16 points on that lighting circuit. Actually, for the smoke alarms, they were run in PVC trunking, so I need to change the reference method on that to reference method B. Uh, cables enclosed in conduit or trunking on a wall or floor. Oh, that will be more accurate for that. So that's it. I've got my circuit schedule filled out now. Um, there's a couple of things that you need to know. If you've got a ring circuit, you tick the RFC column. And then what it will do is ask for the ring final circuit reading. So for example, if this socket's radial was actually a ring circuit, if I tick it, it gives me the inputs for the ring continuity readings and it will add those spaces into the circuit schedule but in this case it's not a ring final circuit so I'll untick that. So if we go now on to test results here we go and you can see it's automatically filled out my insulation readings which is fine because those were the readings that I got but if one particular circuit had a lower reading all I would do is just tick other and then change it to whatever the reading was. Um, now here, this is a brilliant feature. You set circuit default values and you can select your insulation resistance test voltage, which was 500, your insulation resistance readings live to neutral, which in this case I'll put limitation because I didn't test between line and neutral for most of the circuits because there was connected equipment. Uh, live to earth, I select greater than 500 mega ohms. Polarity, so I can select a standard that the polarity was good. 
and AFDDs, if you've got them, you can select a pass or fail for your, all your AFDDs, but there weren't any in this case, so I just put NA. When I save changes, it adds those things in already, so it saves me from filling them out every single time. For R1 and R2, I didn't do R1 and R2 tests because I always just do R2. So I'm just going to put NA for all of those. And then for my R2 readings, I can just go through and fill all of those in. So for my cooker circuit, I had 0 0.08. For the boiler circuit, I had 0 0.39. For the sockets, I had 0 0.76. For the other socket circuit, I had 0 0.67. For the smoke alarms, I had 1.21. And for the lighting, I had 1.08. So that's filled that out. My earth loop impedance readings. For the cooker, I had 10.8. For yeah, okay, so now I've put that in. See what comes up when measured. Uh, the measured ZS is greater than the maximum ZS for this circuit. An observation has been added. So that's great. So as soon as you've got a ZS reading higher than the max, uh, according to the regulations, it will add an observation in for you automatically, which is brilliant. So I'll do the same for water heater, 10.89. Sockets, uh, 11. Point other sockets 11.1 smoke alarms 11.8 and uh, my little window is getting in the way here so I'm just going to move my face out of the way for a second and then the lights 11.5 so that's done Okay, so that's all good now. Um, if I click on ring final circuit continuity, because there aren't any ring final circuits, it's just got it blank here. But if I did add a ring final circuit to my schedule, then it gives me the options of the circuit number, the resistance of R1, Rn, and R2. And then you've got this AOC, which means absence of continuity. So if, for example, there was a break in the ring continuity for R1, which is the line conductor, you would tick that and again it would put an observation to say that we've got an absence of continuity for R1 in circuit number 3 or whatever it is. So that's really handy. Then RCD details, right? So because each of those circuits uh, in circuit details were RCBOs, 61009s, automatically it adds an extra section for RC details and, uh, RCD details and test results. And again, I can set default values for this. So if I click my default values, operating current, they're all 30 milliamp. Number of poles, I believe that they were all single pole. Uh, let's have a look. Yes, they are single pole. Yep, it's only switching the line conductor. So single pole, so I'll put one pole. Operation at half times, they all didn't trip. Test operate, test button operation, pass. Now one of them didn't pass, so I will go back to number two and I'll put fail. So I'll show you the RCD testing now and then uh, we'll go and fill in the readings. So it's at 43 minutes and 30 seconds. Here we go. So we've got zero degrees, all above 200. And then for S1 times, we've got 18.2, 28.2. 18.2, 28.2. Okay, so that's our first circuit, the cooker circuit. One times was 18 point, oh no, it was 28.2, the highest, and five times was 28.2 as well. Okay, then the next circuit. Next circuit.
So this is the one that wouldn't trip when I press the test button and it's still not tripping when it should. So it doesn't work at all. So I'm gonna to need to replace that RCPA. All right, so that one failed completely. So I'll put fail because it doesn't trip with the test button. And then for operating time, I'll just put greater than 310 for I delta N and greater than 50 for five times I delta N because that's what the tester came up with. Um, so I'm just going to flick through these now. I'm not going to show you through the whole video, but I've got all the readings down here. So I had 24.6. So that is all our RCD readings put in now, which is great. If you want, you can set uh, the display order so you can change the order in which they're displayed, but that's not necessary in this case. Uh, but yeah, there we go. All our RCD tests are in. So now we can go to board observations and you can see that circuit one, it's put it down as the uh, ZS is higher than it should be, which is good. Now, why hasn't it done that for the other circuits? Let's go back to the test results. So 16 amp breaker maximum ZS should be 2.73 so why hasn't it come up strange um, Okay, never mind. What I'll do then in board observations, uh, I'll just put DB1 circuits 1 to 6. Maximum ZS readings exceed max ZS on board DB circuits 1 to 6. So that's done, and that's coded it as a code 2 automatically. Now there is RCD protection, so you know. Technically, you could get away with it, maybe, but um, I would code it as a code too. If we look in our uh, NAPIT EICR Code Breakers book, this is a fantastic book, by the way. If you do EICRs, this gives you guidance on how to code things. So I'm going to be using this book throughout this video to code the various non-compliances that we find. Right, so what we'll do now is we'll go to our inspection schedule and we're going to fill out the inspection schedule starting with the main intake equipment. So that's point one, DNO supply intake equipment, which is the main cutout fuse, etc. Condition of service cable was okay. Condition of service head was okay. Condition of distributors earthing arrangement was okay. Meter tails were okay. Metering equipment was okay. There is no main isolator, so we're going to put NA for that. DNO supply intake equipment general observation. Put NA, there's nothing else to add there. Uh, adequate arrangements for other sources such as micro generators. That's if you've got like solar PV or something like that, uh, but we don't have anything like that, so we'll put NA here. Okay, so for presence and condition of distributors earthing equipment, I'm going to put here uh, C2, potentially dangerous. And then I'm going to put down here. Let's see if there's an... Here we go. External earth loop impedance exceeds maximum permitted value. Recommend contacting DNO. Brilliant. So it's got that already there for us. So we just select that and click Done. And that's added that in for us. Now it's ticked NA already for presence and condition of earth electrode because obviously it knows that we're not a TT system. Provision of earthing bonding labels at all appropriate locations. I'll put pass for that. Confirmation of earthing conductor size. So I'm going to put for this, based on the, um, the NAPIT book, it says there that if the main 
earthing conductor is incorrectly sized, it's a C2. So I'm going to put that down as a C2. There we go. Potentially dangerous. And then I'm going to select here earthing conductor un undersized in accordance with tables or connection, not electrically or mechanically sound. Um, Main earth provision at DNO undersized. Yeah, well, let's do that one, I think. Because it's only six mil, so we need to put something in for that. So that's done. And just to show you that, just so you know what I'm talking about um, here. There we go. You see that? That's only six mil cable that's going from there to the main earthing terminal. That's what I was talking about. That was no good. So that needs upgrading to 16 millimeters squared. Uh, accessibility and condition of earthing conductor at MET. Seem to be okay. Confirmation of main productive bonding conductor sizes. Right, so there was main bonding to the gas, but it was six mil. So if we skip forward to that particular section here we go and underneath you can see there is a green yellow six mil cable going up into it there we go so that's our six mil for the gas so what we need to do is put something down to say that it's undersized so in the NAPIT book under section 3.6 it says the main protective bonding conductor to the installation, um, water, gas or oil, is a 6 mil conductor without thermal damage and the installation is a TNCS supply, code 3. But for main protective conductor incorrectly sized on a TNS, it says it's a code 2. Interesting. Let me know in the comments if you know why there's a difference between TNS and TNCS in this case. Um, I'm going to put it down as a code 3 because usually I calculate these and with the adiabatic equation they're actually okay at 6 mil. Um, so I'm just going to put main conducting uh, bonding conductor not correct size. Okay, it does say PME requirements here. Main protecting is two gases undersized in accordance with BS seven six seven one. That's what I'm going to put. So interesting that I need to um, gen up on why it's more dangerous in a TNCS system than it is in a TNS system, or the other way around rather. Uh, condition and accessibility of main protective bonding conductor. At Connection. So I did notice that it was a bit of a dodgy Coming through connection. This air vent and just sort of slung in. So I'm going to check inside the meter box and see if it's clamped on properly. Okay, so here it is. Uh, I'll zoom in. So it was a bit of a dodgy connection we on do there. have a, a clamp on here. Um, but there's no warning label on it, electrical earth connection do not remove, and the, the wires there are a little bit splaying out from the thing. Not great, so probably worth redoing that connection. So I recommended redoing the connection, and I just put the condition as um, improvement recommended. Again, in the NAPIT book, it says main protective bonding connection made with inappropriate termination, C3. So what I'm going to do here is select the nearest applicable option. Poor termination, that sounds about right. Loose, inaccessible or showing signs, visible signs of corrosion. Uh, poor termination... Loose connection joints showing visible signs. Uh, bonding connected to in. Yeah, so I'll do the gas one. 
um, showing and loose termination. That's about right. So we we'll click that. So that's a code three. Accessibility and condition of other protected bonding conductors is not applicable. There was no um, supplementary bonding, for example. So we leave that blank. Earthing and bonding arrangements not covered by any BS 7671 section. That's not applicable. There's nothing that um, nothing that fits that bill. So now we come on to section four: consumer unit slash distribution boards. Adequacy of working space accessibility to consumer unit and distribution board was fine. Security of fixing was also fine. Uh, condition of enclosure in terms of IP rating. Let's just go back and see what we had for that, if we had any comments about that. Here we go. And the outgoing cables come out of the top of a consumer unit, but it is IPXXB. It's, it's nicely sealed around the cables. There's no other knockouts there. And this screw is a bit loose, which is not great. So the lid can actually pull off slightly. So we need to have a look at that. That was easily fixable though, I just um, needed screwing in, so I'm not gonna note that down. That's about it for observations in the consumer unit cabinet. So the consumer unit IP rating was fine. Uh, fire rating, so it was a metal consumer unit. Um, let's see what it says in the NAPIT book about section 4.4 fire rating. Um, it says about non-combustible consumer units. If they show signs of thermal damage, then you should code it as a C2. But if it's not showing signs of thermal damage, then it would be a C3. But in this case, it's fine because it was a non-combustible consumer unit. Oops, there we go. Yeah, okay. Uh, enclosure not damaged or deteriorated so as to impair safety, that's fine. Presence of linked main switch, yes, that's fine. That means you know that both of the poles of the main switch are linked so that if you isolate the live, you isolate the neutral as well. Operation of main switch functional check. So that was fine, that did work. Manual operation of circuit breakers and RCDs to prove disconnection. So I didn't show this on the video, but what you should do is actually have a tester on the outgoing terminals of the circuit breakers and then turn them off and just check to make sure that it does actually turn off the power because sometimes you get an MCB or an RCBO, you turn it off, but the power's still coming through. There's some kind of internal circuitry that's stuck uh, closed. So it's worth to check that. Correct identification of circuit details and protective devices. I'll put pass for that, that was fine really. Uh, presence of RCD six monthly test notice at or near consumer unit. Let's check back and see. So yes, it's got the test label there, so that's fine. Uh, Non-standard colour warning notice, again that's the yellow one there which says that there's mixed wiring colours, so we put pass for that. Uh, presence of alternative supply warning notice, that's not applicable because there's no alternative supplies. Presence of other required labelling, so what other labelling was there? There was an EICR label. Um, so we can put pass for that. What else have we got? Compatibility of protective devices, bases and other components. Correct type and rating. No signs of unacceptable thermal damage, arcing or overheating. That was fine. They all looked okay. Single pole switching or protective devices in line conductor only. So that means that the... Um, circuit breaker is not switching the neutral conductor instead of the live conductor, for example. Um, that's fine, that's a pass. Mechanical protection where cables enter a consumer unit and distribution board. Well, we did see that it had those grommets um, around the cables, so that was fine. Mechanically protected. Uh, electromagnetic effects. So you would have an issue with electromagnetic effects if the mains tails came in in two separate holes through a metal consumer unit that can create what's called eddy currents where it can start to overheat the the metal so you want to avoid that if you've got a metal consumer unit both the phase and neutral conductors should go through the same hole 
so that you don't get eddy currents. That's what this is talking about, basically. So that's a pass. RCDs for fault protection. So if we go over the information, it will explain um, confirmation that RCD devices are installed where required to fulfill the relevant disconnection times provided for fault protection. So basically, sometimes uh, the circuit readings are too high to satisfy the requirements for fault protection with uh, an MCB. So you have to provide an RCBO. That's what it's talking about. Um, so in this case, I mean, technically you could say yes, so that is applicable because the, R, the ZS readings were higher than they should be to provide uh, fault protection, so RCBOs would be necessary. But it wasn't designed to be like that, so I'm kind of hesitant what to put about that really. I'm just going to put NA. RCD is provided for additional protection, so that's um, for your 30 milliamp protection for the various things that need it according to the regulations. That's a pass, kind of, because there was one particular circuit which didn't pass, but I think we'll come on to that later on with the RCD protection section, so we'll fill that in there. SPD, there wasn't any, so that's not applicable. All conductor connections were correctly located where well, you saw me check the connections in that video, so that's fine, that's a pass. Adequate arrangements where a generating set operates, well, that's not applicable. Adequate arrangements where a generating set operates in parallel, again, not applicable. Consumer unit distribution board not covered by any item. So anything that's kind of missed in BS 7671 but you want to add, you can add it here. But I'm just going to put not applicable for that. So final circuits. Identification of conductors. Uh, confirmation that required that uh, cables and conductors are correctly identified by colour lettering and numbering. So you would have noticed in the video that there was... Uh, absence of correct identification of conductors for some of the switches and also <coughs> for the earth conductors for example here and here so these switch conductors I've just drilled a hole in the back of this back box and it's sharp as anything so I've rectified that straight away so these uh, blue and yellow conductors should be sleeved red to identify them as live conductors. So that's something we could put in here under section 5.1. And if I look in the NAPIT book to see what it suggests, um, line conductors incorrectly identified by color code. Uh, it does say that as a code three, but then it, Later on, it says grey or black switch line conductor of three core cable not marked as brown is not applicable. Grey neutral conductor of three core cable not marked as blue not applicable. So this was three core cable and So it's not a line conductor. I guess that's what you could say. It's not a line conductor. It's a switch line conductor. So it does indicate that actually you wouldn't code it if it's just the switch line conductors that aren't identified. So I'm just going to put pass for that. Cables correctly supported throughout their run. As far as I can remember, that was fine. Condition of insulation of live parts was also fine. Non-sheathed cables protected by an enclosure in conduit ducting trunking. Well, there was no non-sheathed cables to, to talk about, so. Um, oh, to include the integrity of uh, conduits and trunking systems, both metal and plastic. So we'll put pass for that. Uh, there we go. We'll put pass for that uh, because Actually, we did have trunking for the fire alarm cables. Adequacy of cables for current carrying capacity with regard to the type and nature of the installation. 
that was a pass. Coordination between conductors and overload protective devices. So this is where we mention our maximum ZS readings being too high for the um, circuit breakers. So we can put that in there. Adequacy of protective devices type and rated for fault protection is fine. Um, presence and adequacy of circuit protective conductors. So this was a problem and I'll show you where. So if we go to the kitchen. So when doing the R2 test, this switch doesn't have any earth continuity, so I'm going to take it off and have a look. So taking the cover off and this is what we found. So that's why the box is not earthed. Uh, so here we go. They've just twisted these together, but they've not connected them to the back box. So that's going to need sorting out. That was one example, and then it there's another example. It blackens there as well, so I don't know if there's been some kind of sparking going on. But, I mean, the whole thing, they've just, they've just drilled a hole in the back of this back box, and it's sharp as anything. So I've rectified that straight away. I've just managed to stretch it across and put it into the earth terminal in the back box there. So at least that's earth now. So when I've tested we go. R2 to this point, there's no earth to this point either. So presumably there's another junction box somewhere around here that's uh, got a loose earth wire in it. Now it doesn't really matter because these are class two drivers. So the earths, the, the light fittings don't actually need an earth but still the cabling should be protected by its own uh, circuit protective conductor within the cable. So I'm going to try and find out where the break is. So that was a clear violation of this adequacy of uh, circuit protective conductors. So in section 5.8 in the NAPIT um, code breakers book, there has been no provision of a circuit protective conductor on a lighting circuit with class two fittings and accessories. So that's down as a class uh, as code three. If it was a class one light fitting, then it would be down as a code two. Uh, so we can code it as a code three in this case. And then we can suggest from the standard um, our adequate absence of CPC two. Okay, I'm just going to put absence of continuity to circuit protective conductor cable because the cable was there but it wasn't actually continuous. So I'm going to put that um, Uh, in kitchen lights. There we go. So, wiring systems appropriate for the type and nature of the installation and external influences. That was fine. Um, cable, concealed cables installed in prescribed zones. That was fine. Cables concealed under floors, above ceilings, in partitions, adequately protected against mechanical damage. I think that was also fine. Provision of additional requirements for protection by RCD not exceeding 30 milliamps for all socket outlets of rating 32 amps or less, unless an exception is permitted. So this is basically saying all the sockets need to be RCD protected by a 30 milliamp RCD, which they are. Additional requirements for protection by RCD not exceeding 30 milliamps for the supply of mobile equipment for use outdoors. Again, all the sockets were RCD protected, so that's fine. Um, provision of additional requirements for protection by RCD not exceeding 30 milliamps for cables concealed in walls at a depth of 50 mil. So that's talking about like for example, switch cable drops in the walls, buried in the walls, not um, not buried more than 50 mil. 
they should be RCD protected, which all the lighting circuits were. Provision of additional requirements for protection by RCD, not exceeding 30 mm for cables concealed in walls and partitions containing metal parts, regardless of depth. So I don't think there were any metal stud walls. It was quite an old house. Metal stud is more of a modern thing, so that's not applicable. But in a place where you, a new build, for example, where they use metal studs in the walls, then you would put that down. Provision of additional requirements for protection by RCD not exceeding 30 milliamps for final circuits supplying luminaires within domestic household. Again, that's a pass because it did have a lighting circuit, did have RCD protection. Provision of fire barriers, sealing arrangements and protection against thermal effects. Pass. Band 2 cables separated from band 1 cables. That's talking about basically data cables being run with power cables. They should be separated. That's fine, I didn't notice any issues there. Cables segregated and separated from communications cabling. Again, similar kind of uh, thing. Segregated from non-electrical services. So that would be things like um, a gas pipe, for example. In fact, if I look in the NAPIT Code Breakers book, it might give me an indication of what issues you might have there. So... Uh, section 5.16 power cables have been secured to the gas installation pipe have you ever seen that the gas bonding cable has just been run along with the gas pipe and lashed to it maybe cable tied to it or something that's a code 3 if you find that but everything was fine with that uh, termination of cables at enclosures indicate extent of sampling in extent and limitations of the report Connection soundly made and under new no undue strain. Um, so that's fine. That was a pass. And it does say that we should indicate the sampling extent. So I usually do ten percent, which means that one in ten accessories I actually remove them for visual inspection and do sampling. But if there's a lot of problems, then I usually up it. I think in this installation, I probably did more like twenty percent actually. Termination of cables at enclosures indicate the extent of sampling. Again, uh, that was fine. Termination of cables at enclosures connection. Oh, yeah, so this is talking about no basic installation, installation of a conductor. Visible outside enclosure. That should be insulation, so I need to... Uh, contact Vespula about that. They made a little boo boo there. 5.17.2. Little spelling mistake, it does happen. Uh, termination of cables at enclosures. Connection of live conductors adequately enclosed. That was fine. Termination of cables at enclosures adequately connected at point of entry to enclosures. So that's like if you've got a cable going into enclosure and it should have a gland, then it's, you know, whether it has a gland or not. Um, I mean, in, with these, the shed wiring probably fails all of these, to be honest. Uh, there was access, you know, live conductors adequately enclosed. They were definitely weren't in the shed. So... Let's go to the shed wiring and we'll just talk about this section with the shed wiring because I think that's quite important. Here we go. This was absolute, absolutely mad, the shed. The uh, main isolator and actually it looks like the inside of David Savory's office in here. <laughs> Laughing at my Full of jokes. cobwebs and uh, a madness poster. Pretty much sums it all up. But we do have a mini consumer unit here with some terrible wires coming out the top, a spider's nest of a light switch, and some really badly clipped cables that have just got nails bent over to hold them in place. Although I suppose that does comply now with uh, the uh, avoidance of premature collapse of cabling. There's a nice uh, connector block there with a bit of flex in connected to a baton holder a lovely old light fitting up there in the eaves and a um, beautiful socket here perfectly IP rated as you can see uh, so 
I'm just going to strike this building off and say needs full rewire. Um, I will just check if there is power coming out to here, but I presume it's that twin and earth uh, 2.5 that's coming out the wall. In fact, you can see it here. Look. It comes out of uh, a switch fuse connection unit. Connection soundly made and under no due undue strain. No basic ins insulation of a conductor visible. Well, there was because that was the um, that shed socket and, and all that. So um, I'm going to put potentially dangerous there. C two five five point one seven dot two in the Napit book refers to. Um, Junction box not fully enclosing PVC PVC cable sheath exposed single insulated inner cores code two cable connection joint in live cables not made within an enclosure access to live parts so generally if there's access to live parts it's a code one if there's access to um, basic insulation of a conductor then it's a code two so in this case it's just a code two and it just says um, absence of mechanical protection to PVC insulated copper conductors. That'll do. Termination of cables, connection of live conductors adequately in space, exposed, enclosed. I'm going to put code one for that because there was access to live conductors. Um, poor termination of conductors including access to live parts. With all of these, by the way, you've got an option to attach an image as well. So if you want to, uh, you can put a picture of everything in there and it will attach it into the document in the schedule of inspection, which is really handy. Uh, right, what else have we got here? Where am I? 5.17.4 Adequately connected at point of entry to enclosure. Um, you know, again, that's probably a fail, really, because of that shed. So, inadequate termination of cables. Missing fixings to electrical switch gear. Um, let's do inadequate termination of cables. Condition of accessories, including a, a socket outlet switches and joint boxes. Okay, so. That one is going to be a code one because there was um, antiquated electrical switch gear, poor condition of electrical enclosures or accessories, and I'll just put in shed for that. That'll do the trick. There was access to live parts at that double socket. Suitability of accessories to external influences. Okay, so let's talk about that. So. If we go to the lighting outside, here we go. DIY jobby. So lovely bit of work here. We've got this beautiful. Uh, so what do you reckon? Is that switch compliant with this requirement to um, be suitable for external influences? This is outside. That is not an IP rated switch. So straight away that fails that requirement. So I'm going to put uh, potentially dangerous code two, and let me just check what it says in the Napit book five point one nine. Um, light fitting installed on the external wall is not weatherproof. Well, if it's a light switch, then it's the same kind of issue really. That's probably the closest it's got. So that's a code two, so I'm right. Um, so I'm just gonna put here, adequate absence of adequate provision of protection of electrical switchgear and accessories against external influences. That's 
probably about right. Outside lights. Just so we've got a reference for where these issues are. Um, adequacy of working space, accessibility to equipment. I think that was fine. Single pole switching or protective devices in line conductors only. Aha, yes, this is a, an interesting one. I didn't actually take this switch off during the inspection, but when I went back to remove it later on, it was actually switching the neutral conductor, not the live conductor. So I could actually put that down. Uh, and if we look at 5.21 in the Napit book, it says... Uh, supply to the uh, socket outlet with reverse polarity is a code 2, but it doesn't talk about actually switching off the neutral conductor to a light. So, but I would say it's a code 2 as well, to be honest. Um, and we did have a socket which had reverse polarity as well, so let's have a look at that. Oh, lovely. <laughs> Jackpot. So we've got reverse polarity on this one. Um, so, yeah, another DIY bodge, no doubt. This is why it's important to actually do a test at every single socket if possible, because you never know whether some might have reverse polarity. So there we go, reverse polarity at a socket outlet definitely is a code two according to the Napit book and I would agree with that so we're going to put that down here as C2 potentially dangerous but I'm just going to put um, socket outlet has reverse polarity So that's a great thing. You can just add your own descriptions if they if there's nothing that matches in their standard text. But most of the time, there is something that matches. Provision of relevant certification confirming the electrical installation or alteration has been inspected and verified. Um, I would put NA for that. Final circuits not covered. I'm just going to put NA for that. Right, S num section six. Locations containing a bath or shower. So we have here additional protection for all low voltage circuits by RCD not exceeding 30 milliamps. So that's fine. We do have RCD protection for all the circuits in the bathroom. Where used as a protective measure, requirements for SELV or PELV are met. So that would be usually in a bathroom when you have SELV. It stands for separated extra low voltage, by the way. And it's where you have an isolating transformer and low voltage. So you may have that, for example, in the case of uh, low voltage down lights in a bathroom with isolating transformers. Uh, shaver sockets as well, things like that. In this case, there weren't either of those, so I'm going to put NA. And the same for shaver sockets, complying with uh, this BS um, number. I'm just going to put NA for that as well. So, not applicable. Presence of supplementary bonding conductors, unless not required. Well, they're not required in this case, so that's NA. Supplementary bonding would be required if there's no RCD protection. Um, for example, then you would need supplementary bonding instead. Low voltage socket outlets sighted at least three meters from zone one. So that's talking about a normal socket outlet in the bathroom. If there is one, it should be more than three meters from zone one of the bathroom. That's not applicable in this case. There were no sockets in the bathroom. And if there were, there's no way they'd be more than three meters from the bath because the bathroom wasn't three meters uh, size. Suitability of equipment for external influences for uh, install for installed in terms of oh for installed location in terms of IP rating. Sorry, I'm getting tired. Uh, so that is things like the bathroom lights. If we go and look at those, I was not really happy with the bathroom lights because they were and the switches. 
they were a bit loose. They're just rubbish. I mean, there's so many holes in the back of that where moisture could get in. If you spray that with a shower head, I'm not very confident that the water will not get in. Uh, it doesn't have any markings on it to say what IP rating it is, so I would recommend replacement. And definitely, anyway, as it's so loose, it needs replacing. So I um, would say that that doesn't comply with its uh, required IP rating. So that's point uh, six point six. Uh, equipment installed in zones one and two with less than IPX4 ingress protection is a code two. So that's I'm going to put it down as a code two. Obviously, IP, um, zone two, you'd have to measure the ceiling height to see whether it was in zone two. These lights were just within zone two. So um, absence of adequate IP protection of electrical accessories and equipment within a room containing a bath or shower. There we go, that will do. Okay. Suitability of accessories and control gear for a particular zone. Well, the pull switches were not suitable because the string was broken, but I don't know if that's really worth coding there or not. I'm just going to put not applicable. Uh, oh no, yeah. Let's just put pass for that. Suitability of current using equipment for a particular position within the location. Uh, there wasn't really any current using equipment apart from the lights, which I've already mentioned. Locations containing a bath or shower not covered by BS7671, so that's just anything else basically that I found. Uh, so I probably, I'll just mention this here, um, pull cords for pull switches are broken, no insulating piece present. I can just add that in. It's kind of not really covered by BS7671 that, but uh, why is that not come up? There we go. So that's that. Uh, special installations or locations. So if there's any other special installations, like for example, if there's an electric vehicle charging installation on the site, you would add that in there, but in this case, it's not applicable. Anything else not covered by BS7671, not applicable. So I'm just going to flick back through this now and just check to make sure that all of the observations that I've recorded are in, and they all are, so that's good. Great, so um, now I can go to all observations, and it's got my list here of all the observations that it's come up with based on that schedule that I did. So it's quite a lot, as you can see. A few C1s, a lot of C2s, and a lot of C3s. And it's got the reference there each time to the uh, inspection schedule, which is nice. And you can also um, match it up with a circuit number if you want. So for example, uh, the lights in the um, kitchen that were not earthed, I can put that that's circuit six. Um, the mechanical protection to the PVC insulated single copper conductors that would be on the sockets circuit circuit three that's in the shed um, so you can do that go through and put all the DB references if you want and of course you can attach images as well which is really handy so uh, if I do that if I attach a couple of images now um, based on if I take some screenshots so for example this light uh, if I do shift command 4 there we go I'll take a picture of the light there 
and then under the section uh, 6.6 for adequate IP protection I can put a picture in so oh yeah here we go screenshot so I've selected my screenshot now and it's just uploading the image that I've taken there we go and it's got my image there so that's great and I can put light in bathroom like that uh, the socket outlet with the reverse polarity let's do that so let's go to the relevant socket outlet in the installation which was this one I believe there we go yeah you can see that quite clearly so then I can select that take a screenshot and then add my picture in of that socket in a living room There we go. So you get the point. I'm not going to go through and put all the pictures in here, but um, you can do. You can put a picture for every single item, and then it it turns out really nice at the end. I'll show you the PDF at the end so you can see what it looks like. Uh, so what we need to do now is add anything else in that has not come up uh, in our inspection so if I just flick through this video and just see if there was anything else that I wanted to add in oh we uh, that was one thing I wanted to do inadequate number of socket outlets uh, there were lots of extension leads everywhere so I want to put something down about inadequate number of socket outlets so let's do that um, so we'll put inadequate here we go brilliant so you can search all standard text and then you if you just type the beginning it will come up with the rest so that's great so then I can just code that as um, improvement recommended and then again if I want to I can put a picture for it or whatever uh, let's see, anything else that I can think of that was should be coded really? Oh, I need to put in the RCBO um, that didn't trip in time. So if I go back to the inspection schedule, I need to make sure that under the RCD protection section, I put the RCD yeah here we go so actually our CDs provided for additional protection um, I need to change that to uh, code 2 and then I'll put down um, absence of residual and then that is a uh, water heater circuit. There we go. So that adds that part about the RCBO not tripping in time. If I wanted to do it a different way, I could. So if I go back to all observations and then I can just do an add an observation. And if I select here RCBO uh, oh, it's come up with it already. Look, RCBA for boiler circuit has failed. So that must be because I put that in earlier. So I can do it like that. And then if I just click done, I can code it as potentially dangerous. Um, and then I can just delete this one instead. So 
that's a different way of doing it. You can add observations in really easily and there's just a whole massive list of standard observations that you can use for most situations. The whole system's kind of learning and, and improving over time as more and more people use it. So it's a great little system really and it's just very, very intuitive. So now what I'm going to do, go back to general, um, just going to check through, make sure I've put everything in that I need to. So contact details again, I'm going to leave blank, but I wanted to put my limitations and just check those. So here's the limitation. So what I wanted to do as well as operational limitations, I wanted to put could not access uh, room four due to obstacles. In other words, all the mess that was all over the floor. Um, and I can put a picture of that if I want to. Uh, limitations agreed with you just put client and then um, you know just make sure that they're happy with the limitations that you've set out uh, I put no insulation resistance tests carried out between line and neutral conductors due to connected sensitive equipment um, was there any other limitations that we had down I don't think so I'm pretty sure that was it so yeah that's all good limitations are done condition of the installation so now that we have finished the inspection I can say this poor many um, oh, I'll just put the installation was found to be unsatisfactory due to several C1 and C2 defects being found. Urgent remedial action is needed in order to make the installation safe. And then I will put unsatisfactory down. And then just check through this, make sure everything's okay on that. I think so. So we're just about ready to actually um, preview our report now. We can also do uh, an electrical danger report, just so you know. So if I click in electrical danger report, I can put that there's a dangerous condition. Um, for example, um, shock currents, you know, if someone could get an electric shock or there are many potential dangerous items, whatever the dangers are. So in this one, it would be access to life parts, for example. Uh, I can put what they are, the dangerous condition. Uh, life parts accessible in shed. And then I can put uh, precise location shed, socket, date notified, today's date, immediate action taken, isolated circuit, which I did do. I isolated and removed the fuse from the switch fuse connection unit that was protecting the shed. Date action taken, further advice given, rewire shed needed. Okay. So that's a nice little bonus thing that you can get. Uh, preview report. So what I'm going to do now is preview the report and I can choose whether I preview the full EICR, just the DB chart or the electrical danger report. So in this case, I want to just do the full EICR and I can choose to add landscape board schedules, which is nice because otherwise it does them as um, portrait. I'll just show you them as portrait first and then um, we can go with the landscape option as well and show you what that looks like. So this is one of the things I absolutely love about this software is look how smart the resulting EICR is. The whole system that they've created, everything's flexible so 
the sizes of the cells flex and expand and the whole layout sort of changes based on your text. So they don't make the text smaller if there's a lot of text, they just enlarge the, the form. So you can see it just looks so nice and neat. Um, everything is beautifully laid out. In fact, if I just do reports, preview full EICR here, it'll give me a full page um, give me a full page EICR PDF version and I can show you that it's going to be a little bit nicer there we go so uh, it's got a really lovely introduction page here with my company logo and address on which I really like it's got a contents page which tells you the page numbers for the various sections of content then you've got all the client details and installation details your limitations are in there your summary of the installation and again the longer you make that the bigger this page will be it doesn't create continuation pages later on or anything like that uh, which I really like all of this just looks really nice and neat and all your details are in place inspection schedule what I like about this is that it color codes so that you can clearly see if there's a C2 it's orange, if there's a C3 it's yellow and if there's a C1 then it comes up as red so it makes it really nice and easy to locate and as well it's got the circuit reference there so if there is a particular circuit that it's on it calls it the circuit so you can narrow it right down then it gives you a list of the observations and tells you exactly what they are and it codes them in order of, of danger and in this case because I've added pictures on the right hand side it adds your picture in and it tells you you, you know you've got your little caption there next to each picture which is really nice and then our DB schedule they're super nice and neat these DB schedules as I say this way it does it on two pages it does it portrait so that it matches with all the other uh, pages of the EICR and it does the DB schedule on one page and then it does the test results on another page which is fine but if you choose the landscape option then it will actually give you the test results and the DB schedule on one page which is quite nice for at actually attaching to the distribution board uh, later on. It's got a glossary of terms which is really nice Overcurrent protective device abbreviations, uh, lots and lots of nice little bits of info at the end to help your client decode what it's talking about. And the condition report, uh, it just gives you some guidance which helps the client to know how this is a valuable document and uh, that they should have the original report, etc. etc. So really really nice software this from Vespula I must say and it's become my go-to software now um, you can just add your signatures so if I do reports full EICR and it, then it will ask me to add my signatures if I want to I can preview the electrical danger report as well so it's going to create that for me now in a few seconds I can open that up and here it's given me my electrical danger report it tells me what the danger is etc which is really nice uh, then if I want to just do DB schedules I can just do preview DB chart and again it's got a chart so this is just the chart that you would put in the door of the DB or whatever to tell you what circuit does what which is really nice so you can print that off and uh, leave it at the DB or send it to the client to put at the DB. So very very good software let me know in the comments what you think and uh, if you agree or disagree with the way I code things obviously there's always going to be slight variation but I do try to do things as much as I can according to this SNAPIT guidance because I think it's quite accurate and the NIC guidance tends to be similar which I am NIC EIC approved hope you enjoyed this video uh, check out the links in the description for the Vespula software it's very reasonably priced and they've got a free 30-day trial going on at the moment so head over to their website link in the description 
Um, check out their social media. They've got a great presence on Twitter, so go over there and follow them on Twitter. And uh, you can subscribe to the Vespula software for only £99 a year plus VAT, and then it's an extra £50 a year per extra user. So if you've got a big company with you know few guys, each, each of the guys has to be down as a user, but it's only 50 quid extra per year per user, which is very, very reasonable for such high quality software. And as I say, they've got a free 30 day trial now. So why don't you give it a go, try it out and see what you think. Thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already and share this video out to someone else who could benefit from it. Thanks for watching and have a great day.